Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm really pleased to be with you all here today, virtually, but at the moment, I'm actually here at Harmony Hill in the Great Hall. And we're going to talk about a topic today that's been interesting me a lot lately. And it's kind of important because it's right here in our time. And it's how do we make behavioral change? How do we make meaningful behavioral change? The topic of my talk is a functional medicine journey, uncovering certainty and rediscovering soul. So a couple of us, Dr. Deanna Minnick, Dr. Michael Stone, uh, Monique Klass, who's a nurse practitioner, the four of us have been talking for a while about how do you get people to make meaningful behavioral change? And why is it important? And as we've talked about that, we've talked about the fact that it seems like what's missing when it comes to making change is a sense of certainty. And we were all scheduled to be up at a retreat center in Montana, Feathered Pipe Ranch, and we were going to be giving a course in June of this year. And clearly we all know that COVID happened and we didn't go. They've had to cancel the entire summer. And here we are. Um, now it's September. I'm giving this talk virtually. We re recorded it in July. But, you know, it's a really, really interesting time. And that piece about certainty has really kind of rocked all of our worlds. You know, Dr. Stone, Michael, and I have talked about it a good bit because this is like the first time in our careers, certainly in my career, that the answers weren't right there or somewhere. You know, when I was a medical student, I could ask the intern. When I was an intern, I could ask the resident. When I was resident, I could ask the attending. Or as I got to be an attending myself, there was a book. There was always a source. And then the internet brought us a great wealth of information. And all at once, we're in a world where certainty seems to have gone away. And we really don't know all of the answers. And, you know, we're also in a world where there's so much unrest. You know, the political situation in our country has devolved to a point where, you know, everyone's a liar if they don't agree with you. I have my opinion, you have your opinion. If they're not the same, you must be lying. We no longer talk from a point where people can agree that something is certain. All of it is uncertain. And it makes the practice of helping people make change in their lives, helping people achieve their goals, a really, really difficult one when you don't have at least a little bit of certainty. You know, looking at people fumbling with their masks, looking at the people in stores, and there's still a couple around who like don't wear their masks until they get to the cash register because they know that if they have their mask on, they'll be able to check out, but they weren't wearing it in the aisle, they were wearing it on their wrist. As you see people cope with all this, you know that they're uncertain about things. And the issue came up for us as we were preparing and getting ready to teach. You know, what would we teach? What is functional medicine? What is certainty? What is important, meaningful, and valuable? You know, behavioral change has been this really interesting kind of conundrum for a long time because a lot of traditional practitioners, you know, allopathic MDs like me going through traditional medical school, you know, a lot of us don't acknowledge that behavioral change can really happen. And, you know, and there's work that's been done by B.J. Fogg um, at the Stanford Behavioral Lab. Um, and, you know, it's all about um, trying to get people to make little changes. And the belief is that motivation doesn't work. And I think that part of the reason why motivation doesn't work in that setting is because people don't know why they're going to change. If I'm a practitioner and I'm sitting in this room and I'm talking to a patient and I talk to them about science, about their lab results, 
and talk to them in no meaningful way, and if I don't connect with them about what their life is like, and I expect them to change because I've scared them with the statement, you'll be a diabetic in 15 years, you'll have a heart attack in 10, you're going to develop this or you're going to develop that, your aches and pains will become a true autoimmune disease. If I have that conversation with someone, it's going to last about this long. They may make changes for a week, they may make changes for two weeks, but particularly if I give them no additional information, there's not going to be a lot of meaningful change that takes place. And so, you know, the question becomes one of how do we sort through the relevant information that's available to someone? How do we sort through what their life is like? How do we get to a place where there are answers? And, you know, part of that is that you have to understand how we think. You know, there are shortcuts to the way we all think. And one of those shortcuts is called a heuristic. You know, we all have these, um, or one word for these shortcuts is heuristic. It's like a rule, a thinking rule, a logical rule that we have in our heads that we may even do unconsciously. You know, a, a perfect example of this is a number of years back, they went out and asked professional baseball players how they did so well catching pop flies. And everyone said, I keep my eye on the ball. But, so they keep their eye on the ball, but college players keep their eye on the ball, high school players keep their eye on the ball, kids playing peewee baseball keep their eye on the ball, and the peewee kids drop a lot of them, and the pros don't. And yet, they say they have the same rule. So they did some really interesting work filming and videotaping the pros, uh, having them wear the little lights like they use um, when they're doing animation. And so the computer tracked them and see what was up. And one of the things they found was, indeed, they keep their eye on the ball. But they keep their neck fixed. So if the ball's up here, they keep the same angle looking at it. If the ball's falling faster than they expect it, they speed up to keep the same angle. If it's falling slower, they slow down, so they keep the same angle, and because they keep that angle, they end up right under the ball. The unspoken rule for all of them was a heuristic called keep your eye on the ball and keep the angle of your gaze fixed. So, you know, we have to have those same sort of rules when it comes to exploring our world. You know, functional medicine, you know, and, and what is functional medicine? Well, first of all, functional medicine is an approach to look at the whole person. It's to look at a person as um, the most important entity in the room. Instead of their disease, the person is more important. And this has a long, long history of being acknowledged. William Osler, at the turn of the 1800s into the 1900s, he said, you know, it's more important to know the person who has the disease than the disease that the person has when taking care of them. This has been around for a really, really long time, but here we are finally at a place where we're sort of acknowledging this in some of our interactions, sort of. I mean, traditional medicine is still very much locked up in a game of name it, blame it, and tame it. And the tame is usually some sort of single therapeutic drug blockbuster from a pharmaceutical company that's easy to prescribe in a seven minute visit that the representative from the insurance company who's kind of sitting in the exam room even though they're not, but who the medical record's being written for and the ICD-10 code's being given for, that person there wants it to be a seven minute visit. And the model that works for that, the heuristic, is indeed name, blame, and tame. But functional medicine ends up being this exploration of going a little bit deeper and trying to uncover something about who the person is and what's going on with that person and understanding root causes. 
you know, the functional medicine model can almost be acknowledged by um, picking the example of a tree. If we had a big deciduous tree out here, big leaves and oak, and the tree started getting sick on one side, and the branches started going bad, any arborist would come and say, the problem's in the roots, or maybe the problem's in the trunk. But modern medicine has taken that tree and assigned a little part of that tree representing the human body. Well, the pulmonologist gets this side, the cardiologist gets this side, the stomach doctor gets this side, the rheumatologist, the surgeon, the podiatrist, we all get our little piece. And we all think that our little big branch coming out with all the leaves on it is our responsibility. And we, you know, spray paint them green or glue them back on, whatever it may be. But we're forgetting that the same process is in the tree. And so, you know, when you start thinking about things as diverse as gingivitis and coronary artery disease and rheumatoid arthritis, you say, oh, they're not connected. They're all autoimmune conditions. They all are inflammatory conditions. They all actually increase the risk for each other. If you have gingivitis, you're more likely to have coronary artery disease. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, your mortality is increased for cardiovascular disease. So the heuristic is to understand cause, to look at the trunk of the tree and look down. And that's the model that functional medicine practitioners have used for a while. And that model has evolved and grown. You know, Jeff Bland, well, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, Dr. David Jones, Dr. Cindy Baker, some of the founders of functional medicine, you know, they put together these thoughts and they codified it. And we now have the matrix. And actually, Michael Stone, who I referred to earlier, was the first one to, to design a matrix. He wrote it on the back of a napkin in a bar while they were having a discussion one night. And that's what, he still has the napkin. And out of that napkin grew what became the functional medicine matrix that everybody uses today. But, you know, when you look at this, you know, the rules were fairly simple at one point in time. And they're the underlying heuristic for the sort of behavioral change that we want to see people make. And for the practice of medicine that we do and the way we look at the world, it's our heuristic. You know, Sidney Baker had two rules. He called them the tack rules. And one of the tack rules was if you're sitting on a tack, it's going to take a lot of ibuprofen to make you feel better. You know, you just aren't going to get better if the tack is still there. You can't just medicate it away. And then the other rule was that if you're sitting on two tacks, removing one won't make you 50% better. And so, you know, these become kind of that basis for understanding what the body needs and understanding what needs to be taken away from the body in order to help what insult maybe needs to be removed, or how do we help the body detoxify? And that's the functional medicine journey. And when Michael and Deanna and Mameek and myself and others, because we've got a fairly extensive group of people who will be on the teaching team, um, if we ever do get to teach at a retreat, which we're hoping to do here at Harmony Hill at some point, and we're hoping to do elsewhere, but if we ever really do, we started asking the question, around behavioral change in the very same fashion. We started asking ourselves the question of, well, how do you get there? You know, what is meaningful behavioral change? Because the BJ Fogg model reduces it to the simplest little behavior. Like he talks about, for example, that if someone isn't flossing their teeth and the resistance that they have is um, it'll take too much time. His behaviorist model is to tell the person to make a very, very simple change attached to a trigger that they're already doing. So they brush their teeth each morning, but they don't floss. So what you tell them to do is just open the drawer, pull the floss out, and put it on the counter. And even if you don't floss after a couple weeks, of pulling it out and doing that behavior, it becomes second nature to get the floss out. And then if they haven't started doing it on their own, because most people are going to look at that floss and go, well, I've got it out. 
Well, if they haven't done that on their own, you ask them to floss one tooth or floss one side of your mouth or floss the front teeth. And then hopefully over time, the behavior becomes adaptive and it comes into your life. And the premise for BJ, who has admittedly, he admits this, not really looked at how to change bad behaviors, he tries to crowd out bad behaviors by good new behaviors. So he adds in the flossing of the teeth and hopefully you're not gonna have time to do something else that's bad. The flossing of the teeth teeth is going to be more important than something else. But most of us have lives that are overtaxed. Too little time, too much going on. And we're seeing that now in the midst of this COVID epidemic, you know, where we have all new ways of being in the world. We were just, some of us having an informal discussion this morning before I started speaking about what it means if kids are going to be home from school for six months. What does that mean for their lives? What does it mean for their parents' lives? Um, you know, what will it be? I talked with the a manager of a sandwich shop in Gig Harbor who was telling me that their business is through the roof. And it's because everyone being home all day long, moms and dads don't want to cook three meals a day. They go out and buy lunch when they're doing an errand to bring home to the child who was doing schoolwork. You know, we're changing the way we behave, but we do it in demands to what's outside of us. We do it to what's out there in the world. Like, you know, COVID's making demands on us. Our relationships make demands on us. Our partners make demands on us. Our work relationships are changing now. You know, we no longer, for a lot of us, see our coworker at work. Instead, we're seeing our coworker through a little screen, just like you're seeing me. You know, it's a whole different world. We're at home, we're trying to deal with the responsibilities of work, and the responsibilities of being at home. And work is creeping now over into our lives even more than it ever did. Like I've always been a workaholic and I work well more than my 40 hours a week and my computer's turned on most every day of the week and sometimes for hours. And you know, some of us have chosen that path for a long time, but now, more and more people are being asked by their workplace to do it. You know, you're at home, just walk into your home office and check that email at seven o'clock on Friday night because you know, you're on the East Coast and someone on the West Coast wrote an important email. Like, can you just check it? You know, text, text on the phone, the company phone that you got. You know, we're, the demands are becoming greater and greater. And as those demands become greater, the question becomes one of, how do you get someone to realize that the behavioral change that they want to make is important and meaningful and valuable to them? And it goes back to a really kind of important distinction when it comes to behavioral change. It goes back to the distinction of what's functional and dysfunctional. Now, I'm not using this term in exactly the same way as functional medicine, and I'm not using this term because it's the functional medicine term. I'm using this term because I think it's really important. And that is, things are functional for me if they move me down the path, down the journey towards my life goals. They're dysfunctional for me if they don't. Um, I was the school doctor at a boarding school in Virginia for a while, Episcopal High School, and we had a psychologist come and talk with the adolescents there. It was ninth grade through 12th grade, and we had them come talk about behaviors and acceptable behaviors. And we had all sorts of rules. You know, we had rules about what could take place in a dorm room, what couldn't, i.e. no sex in a dorm room, you know, no alcohol in a dorm room, no drugs in the dorm room, what could take place elsewhere on campus. There was a little area out in the woods which ever since the 1960s had been called Vietnam. 
and it was out behind the football field, and what went on out there was kind of okay. No one really asked. It was like Dead Poets Society, right? The movie with Robin Williams when they went off to the cave in the woods. What they did out there, yeah, we don't really see. But it affects the way kids behave. And you know, you have these discussions, right? You know, you have, um, we had this huge discussion over a party, you know, that was given off campus. And some of the kids who attended didn't have permission to go to someone's house. And so they hadn't signed out to go to this house. And some kids had signed out to go to the house. And some kids lied about going to the house. And we suddenly had all sorts of social consequences that were, that were different. Because the kids who had signed out and said, I'm going for the weekend, didn't get punished. Even though there was video of them being falling down drunk. But the kids who said that they were going somewhere else, and so hadn't signed out to go be with the parent, were technically still on the school's rules, still on the school's responsibility, so they got in trouble. And the kids who lied about being there initially got booted from school because it was an honor offense. So we brought in a psychologist to talk about behavior because it became very clear that behaviors aren't good or bad. They're not necessarily just because someone else sees them through the eyes of healthy or unhealthy. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthy or unhealthy for someone. You know, if I'm an endurance athlete and I've been exercising well, and someone tells me, change your exercise program to walking 10 minutes once a day, it's not going to be healthy for me. I'm going to deteriorate. My health is going to get worse. Similarly, if I'm underweight and someone tells me to eat a high calorie diet, that wouldn't be the same diet I prescribe for someone who was overweight who needs a different calorie diet, or needs a different macronutrient diet, or micronutrient, or a whole different focus. You know, what works for one doesn't work for another. And it became very clear when we talked with these kids about the difference between functional roles and dysfunctional roles. You know, an example that we used with them, if you're at home, with your parents and you're 17 years old and it's Christmas break and three friends are over and everybody's spending the night and the parents let you have one beer apiece while having pizza and watching a basketball game, well, it's illegal. The parents could go to jail. Is it really dysfunctional though? Well, not so much. No one's gonna get hurt from drinking one beer unless one of the kids sends a picture that the police see. The police aren't showing up to arrest the parents for giving the beer. But if those same kids came back to school and brought a quart of bourbon back with them and decided to drink it in their dorm room and chugged it, that would be problematic. Similarly, you know, if we had a boy or girl decide that they wanted to sleep with everybody in their class, you know, that would truly be dysfunctional behavior in a school where these behaviors were limited. If they snuck away at the end of the year with a boyfriend in a safe situation, if it's a girl or boy or whatever the situation may be, two people partnering in a safe situation may not be that dysfunctional. There's risks, but it's not as dysfunctional um, as you know, sleeping with everyone in the entire junior class. You know, all of these choices we make in life, all of them are about function and dysfunction. And you have to get people to start looking at that. But more important, what I would judge to be dysfunctional, you know, what maybe wouldn't work for me, and this is the beauty of functional medicine and trying to understand an individual, what wouldn't work for me necessarily isn't going to work for somebody else, you know, um, or may work for someone else. You know, like if, if I, you know, genetic uniqueness, we're like beginning to finally understand this. So if we're in a setting, for example, where um, my genes say you need a higher fat diet, and someone else's genes say, I need a higher carb diet, well, we're not going to do very well. Or, depending what our goals are, right? 
you know, if I sit here and say that I want to kayak in a ridiculously long way next summer, and I'm actually considering trying to do the paddle that goes from um, Tacoma up to um, uh, Port Townsend. It's a 70 mile paddle and it's a race and you do it in 48 hours. I'm thinking about doing that. My exercise program has to be different than someone else's. My goals will be different than someone else's. You know, someone else who's 60 years old may have a goal of walking 10 minutes with a grandchild. Someone else has a goal, like me, of paddling a ridiculously long distance and trying to convince friends, and Michael, that we're going to go paddle that long distance together next summer. But, you know, we all have different goals, so it would need a different exercise program. So it becomes really important to know the person who you're prescribing for. But even more important than that, the person sitting on the other side of the table has to know themselves. They have to know what's important, meaningful, and valuable. You know, one of the big problems with medicine, Western medicine, and even it happens in functional medicine, it happens in any of the fields, is that because I'm sitting on this side of the consultation room table, I think I'm in charge. You know, I'm the one who makes the pronouncements. You go do whatever I told you to do, right? You know, for some of us, you know, you know, I can sit here and make a joke about name, blame, and tame in the pharmaceutical model, and I pulled out my prescription pad, which amazingly, most Americans recognize as a sign that the doctor's visit is over. If the doctor starts writing on the prescription pad, they know they're supposed to shut up and they know they're supposed to leave because the transaction just took place. They got a prescription. You know, while that's one model, the other model is I could sit there and list off six supplements that I want you to go buy. You know, it takes place, it's kind of this fed across the table model, which is problematic. It used to be worse. You know, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, in the 1970s, patients didn't get very well informed about what was taking place. And they were told, you're going to have this surgery. This is going to happen to you. I remember being at the VA in residency, and um, I'm sorry, in um, medical school, and the resident was listening to the intern talk, and so was the attending. And the intern was saying, we're taking Mr. Jones's right leg off tomorrow morning. And I happened to be looking at Mr. Jones, and Mr. Jones started crying. And you know, he's an older vet. He's used to allowing authority to do stuff. And I said to the attending, Mr. Jones is crying. And, um, and the attending turned and looked at Mr. Jones and said, um, why are you crying? And he goes, well, I thought my right leg was my good leg. I thought you were taking my left leg off tomorrow. He wasn't going to say anything. That was the old model of medicine. And it was wrong. And, but we've gone through this transition now where attorneys have said, and you know, because you know, attorneys have like changed the way we do informed consents. If you're a patient and you get an informed consent before surgery these days, you get like a list of all the risks that could possibly happen to you with the surgery and you get the benefits and the surgeon just kind of stands there and looks at you and goes, so what do you want to do? Well, that doesn't help. I mean, you know, it takes years of education to be able to write the list of benefits and the list of risks down. And with those years of education, you get judgment. And the patient's experiencing it for the first time, and it's unfair. And you know, what has to happen is, yes, they have to hear about all the risks, and they have to hear about the benefits, but they need a little bit of grace. We need to help them figure out what's important, meaningful, and valuable to them. And we also need to give them a little bit of a hint
think about what you do. Like when I give informed consents to people or when I give treatment plans to people and say, well, you could do this or you could do that, and here's blah, 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 and give all the details, I'll also say something like if I'm talking to you know, a 40-year-old man, I'd say, well, you know, if you were my friend or my brother or my son, I would do this for you. And it at least gives them a little bit of space. I don't have to tell them what to do, but it gives them some space. And the model that I like to think about all of this, like on when I'm helping people on their journey to behavioral change, to uncovering some certainty, to rediscovering soul, when I do that, I like to think about it almost like in those old hornblower books, you know, Horatio Hornblower by C.S. Forrester. You know, here you've got the brand new midshipman or the brand new lieutenant, and he's in charge of the ship in the middle of the night, and he's supposed to give the right orders, and he's not on his own, though. There's a mate, there's a, a, a non-commissioned officer, a first mate, or somebody, a harbor pilot, someone giving him advice. He has to make the decision, but he's getting advice from someone who's sailed for a lot of years, or someone who's piloted these waters that are hazardous before. And that's what clinicians should do for their patient. Give advice, point direction. And what's missing in this kind of rambling talk, I'm getting to the point, but what's, the point is that what's missing is that most of us don't know where we want our journey to take us. And so we have to figure out how to get there. We have to figure out what is important, meaningful, and valuable to us so that when we choose to make change, it's change that we can really buy into. It's change that becomes functional for us. It's change that allows us to make important differences in our lives. You know, um, years ago, I went to, and this is truly years ago because it's going on 30 years now, I went to Jim Gordon's Comprehensive Cancer Care Conference. No, I'm sorry, it was 20 years ago. Got my dates wrong. Um, went to Jim Gordon's Comprehensive Cancer Care Conference in D.C. And at Jim Gordon, Dr. Jim Gordon um, is at the Center for Mind Body Medicine in D.C. He founded it, and they teach programs, professional training programs, and advanced training programs to practitioners to help them teach mind, body, spirit, wellness groups to deal with trauma, to deal with post-traumatic stress disorder, to deal with chronic illness. But for a three-year period, they gave a group of um, um, conferences on cancer and comprehensive care, total care. You know, so everybody, including the patient, was involved and invited to this conference. So patients attended, and caregivers attended, and practitioners attended, and um, bench scientists attended, the press attended. Everybody attended, and one of the big topics was that even a life-threatening illness can be a gift because it took on that shift. It made people have to think a little bit differently. It took them from having a heuristic which we all accept, uh, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna work hard, I'm gonna work harder, I'm gonna work harder, and I'll have all the toys at the end, and I'll have made a good life for my family along the way, to what is really important. Did you want to write the great American novel? Did you want to do something heroic in your life? Did you want to do this, and did it get lost somewhere along the way? Did that certain place that we have when we're new people in the world, when we're little people in the world. Did it get lost? And, you know, part of the difference between healing and curing, curing is about a disease. Healing is about a person. Healing allows that certainty to come back to a certain degree. You know, if you think about it, if you look at a group of 
children, right? And you ask them what they want to be when they grow up, small kids. You know, they think big, right? I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to be a sports legend. I'm going to be president of the United States. I'm going to be the greatest warrior there ever was. I'm going to lead tanks across you know, Europe and defeat the Russian government. People think big, right? Little kids think big. Maybe they want to be a doctor. Maybe they want to be a nurse, an attorney. But they think big. They want to do things for people. They have this mindset of let's, let's show up in the world. It's an archetype, right? It's the archetypes that Carl Jung talked about when he talked about like hero in, in the journeys that we go on. You know, it's what Joseph Campbell talked about, the development of the hero and the personal journey and achievement, right? We all have those. Well, we lose that creativity somewhere along the way. We start going to school, we start getting normalized by society, we start getting told what we want to do. But you know, that archetype of wanting that journey never, ever goes away. Defining our life, you know, part of the existential angst that a lot of people experience, which probably accounts for things like the increasing suicide rate, the you know, divorce rate, a lot of displeasure in life, a lot of the horrible ways that we treat each other, and maybe even the way we can't have a dialogue with each other anymore, comes about from the fact that we have forgotten. We've lost certainty about what's important and meaningful and valuable to us. So what I'd actually like to do, because I just talked at you for 30 something minutes, what I'd like to do is to do a little exercise with everybody at this point in time. So if you're at home, pay attention for a few minutes. Find a comfortable place to sit, turn off other distractions, sit with your feet flat on the floor, arms uncrossed, and we're just going to do a little bit of a breathing exercise and we're going to do some soft belly breathing and then we're going to actually do a little guided imagery exercise. So what I'd like you to do is just sit comfortably, erect spine, in whatever position makes sense for you so that you're comfortable and take a big breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. And another big breath in and a big breath out. And feel that belly rise with that in breath. Relax that belly so that the diaphragm flattens when you take that breath in and your belly rises. Let it fall back with the out breath. And just take a couple more big breaths in and out. Let your shoulders relax. Let your neck fall forward if it feels like it wants to relax. Big breath in and big breath out. And find that own rhythm your breath and find how there's a pause perhaps between that in breath and that out breath. There's a stillness there. There's an invitation there. There's an opportunity to move towards it. And as you breathe, let your imagination flow into that place and find a place, a safe place. Perhaps you've been there before, perhaps it's real. Perhaps you've only been there in your imagination. Perhaps you've read about it. Perhaps you've always wanted to travel there. But find that place and take a big breath in and a big breath out. And see yourself standing in, in that place, your feet firmly fixed on the ground. And notice your surroundings. Are you out 
outdoors? Are you indoors? Is it warm? Is it cold? Is it night or day? Is it cloudy or sunlit? Can you hear the noises in the breeze? Is there a gentle hum of insects and birds? Can you smell flowers in the air? Or maybe the smell of a kitchen that makes you feel at home? Whatever the smells, whatever you see, whatever you hear, whatever you can taste, or touch, look around and note the things that are here, the things that make you feel safe and secure and comfortable and relaxed. And if you notice what's here, if you notice what's around you, if there's something there that's keeping you from being relaxed and comfortable and safe. Let it go. It's like baggage that you can drop down and leave behind you. Just let it drift out of your thoughts and it will disappear from your safe place. And if there's something you need to make this place safer, bring it in. And as you look around this place, as you notice this place, perhaps you can hear something growing a little bit in volume. Perhaps it's music, perhaps it's the wind, perhaps you can almost hear words spoken, or maybe it's an image that comes to your mind. Whatever that image may be, Perhaps it's calling you to ask yourself what's important, meaningful, and valuable to you. What life journey makes you feel safe and comfortable? What do you want for yourself? What do you want for those right around you that makes you feel warm deep down inside? Perhaps you find this knowledge coming deep from within yourself, not from the outside, but you're finding it when you're safe enough to explore. Just for a moment, think about what's important, meaningful, and valuable. What you'd like to try to gain and bring into your life outside of this place. identified something, remember it, and find something that can be a marker for it, a word that you could use, or a sound, or a taste, or a smell, an association that you will make that will allow you to remember what's important, meaningful, and valuable to you, what you can be certain about. As you hold this knowledge, as you take what you gain, and if you haven't gained a lot, know that you can repeat this exercise on your own again whenever you want. But as you've done it, get ready to say goodbye to this place. But first, thank yourself for taking this little bit of time today to look at what's important, meaningful, and valuable. And as your breath now deepens and you bring yourself back to the room, come on back, bringing back with you your remembrance that you can create your safety and you can create your vision all on your own. And when you're ready, open your eyes with perhaps a smile on your face. 
So that was a little exercise. The goal is to figure out what is certain about us. You know, for me, I'm pretty certain that all of us have something deep inside of us that's really pretty meaningful and important to us that tells us who we are and gives us a unique spark. And, you know, if we discover that, you know, some people call it soul, some people call it spirit, you know, um, a few people call it ego, but ego frequently in my world is the term for, you know, the kind of blend of the id and the super conscious that is the conscious way we show up in the world and that's our ego and it's kind of our outward appearance, it's you know, the way I posture in the world, it's the way I distance myself from others. Soul is going deeper and looking for that place within me where there is the expression that really resonates with what is functional for me, what is going to be my goal in life, where I'm going to go. And for me, spirit is that little spark in me that I'm lucky enough to have received as a gift, that we're all lucky enough to have received as gifts. And in that expression of my soul, you know, I show up wanting to contribute, wanting to do good things, wanting to be in the world. You know, um, I met Harmony Hill and the time that I was in this room before was when I was here for the gala last year. And it was an auction, and I think it was the biggest return that they've had in years. And, but this year's different. There probably isn't going to be that same sort of gala. So if you're listening to this, and they haven't asked me to do this, I'm doing this on my own. If you're listening to this and you've benefited from this, think about how you can make sure that others who share that little spark with you get to hear this message. And there are fundraising opportunities at um, Harmony Hill and other places. You know, it doesn't have to be Harmony Hill, but that little spark, that connection, you know, if you find it in yourself, if you find it when you look, it's actually there in everybody else. And this is an important part, I think. You know, if we uncover our certainty, we know what is meaningful to us, what's important to us, what's valuable to us. And if we realize that it kind of resonates deeply with something inside of ourselves, then we can start taking our journey. We can start taking that next step. You know, um, um, J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, um, has that poem about the road goes ever forth after you've taken the first step off the porch and you don't know where it leads. All of us are on that path. You know, his story was the story of two simple hobbits, two simple people, not heroes, not gods, not wizards, not kings, not warriors who went out and changed the world because they showed up in the world. And they did it because there was something about them, about who they were and how they had shown up in the world that allowed them to do that. You know, we don't see Bilbo or Frodo doing growth work or personal exploration work. We don't hear about, you know, their spiritual practices or anything like that. But they knew who they were. And that is part of what we have to do. And if we can find that, you know, and I believe that we can. I believe that there are exercises that can do this. And um, when um, this video tape is done, we're going to actually show a reading list that will pop up at the end, which we'll add on. But we'll have a reading list for some books that may help a little bit in your journey. They were books that Michael Stone and I made this list a little while ago when we gave a similar talk. But I firmly believe that as we do this work, as we uncover the certainty of who we are, and as we re rediscover 
aspects of our own soul and we see that spirit I think one of the really important pieces here is that if I acknowledge that there's a spirit in me I have to acknowledge that there's a spirit in every one of you all that it's there that it's just as important as mine that it is worthy of reverence and respect as mine you know, my son went to Bellarmine High School over in Tacoma, it's a Jesuit school, and they have um, 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 a statue in the courtyard area, and it's the Virgin Mary holding the baby Jesus, and it's got a Pope Francis quote on it, and the quote is, even the old, the sick, the infirm, um, the lonely, the unborn, every one of them is an image of God's creation, made in his image, and I'm not getting the quote exactly right, but every one of them is perfection. Every one represents his vision. And as such, they're really worthy of respect and reverence from every one of us. And what does that really mean? When I heard that quote, it hit me because it struck me that going back to the work I do every day as doctor and patient, that there's a lot of opportunity for me to judge and for me to pity as opposed to being compassionate. And that part about really seeing the spark in everybody else is a call to compassion. You know, they are perfect just as they are because they have that spark. And I have to show up that way. We all have that challenge of showing up that way. You know, if I look at the person on the other side of the desk and pity them because they're not complete, because they have a disease, then I've allowed myself to fall into the disease treatment model. And I've allowed myself to discount them as someone who I can be distant from. But if I look at them and say they're perfect, just the way they are, I can help them on their journey, I can respect them, I can give them the gifts that I want to give them, but I do it from a place of compassion. And it becomes really important for us to make that movement. You know, in a different setting, we've done the mindful, need, uh, mindful eating exercise, and I'm not going to do it with you all today, but I want to call out aspects of that exercise. You know, typically it's about developing our senses, developing how we taste, developing how we respect our food so we have a different relationship with our food. But if you think about it, a lot of times, and I've heard Deanna Minnick, Dr. Deanna Minnick do this in her talks, um, you talk about respecting and acknowledging the people who grew the food, the people who packaged the food, the people who got it to the store, the people who stocked the shelves, the people who brought it home, the people who cooked it, the people who did every part of it. The food is a gift. Every part of that way, there is someone who has given some part of themselves. And you know, in COVID, the unsung heroes are the people who are standing there in a grocery store to check you out. They'd rather not see hundreds and hundreds of people a day who they don't know and they don't have a chance to take a temperature on and they don't know how many other people they've been with necessarily. They're an unsung hero contributing to that food showing up. Everything we can do can be about that mystery of acknowledging and appreciating and the such like. There's been a lot of work through the years a lot of work through the years talking about relaxation and helping people relax. But you know, the real breakthroughs in all of that work was the heart math stuff by um, Doc Childre and Howard Martin and the work that's continuing to go on in California at the time at you know the Heart Math Institute and um, at Roland McCready at the Heart Math Institute. And they're showing some remarkable things. The difference about heart math is that they're going for something more than relaxation. 
they're going for what they call coherence of the variability in the heart rate. The physiology part isn't important. What's important is you get there through appreciation. You get there through an expression of thankfulness. You get there through an expression of love. You know, whether it's looking at a flower and appreciating its beauty in the morning, or whether it's doing an exercise at night and thanking all the people in our world, whether it's saying grace and thanking them. It's the appreciation for how fortunate we are to be here and how fortunate we are to be surrounded by the people who we're surrounded by. I, you know, this is like the third or fourth time I've given a similar talk, and it's the first one I've given it with a small little audience. And this has been so much easier. I appreciate you all in my audience. That appreciation changes how I show up in the world. And it becomes really, really, really important. So in this time of uncovering certainty amidst COVID, of rediscovering soul amidst all the contrasting and loud voices that are out there, if you can find some certainty deep inside of you, if there's something special within you, recognize that it's there in everybody else. And maybe we're being called, you know, maybe this whole crisis point is we're being called to change the way we show up. Someone has to. Someone has to show up differently or we're going to have continued unrest on our streets. We're going to continue to have children and seniors and everyone exposed to diseases if we don't show up differently in the world, if people don't lead, and it's not one leader who we need, every one of us needs to be a leader. Everyone needs to stand up for what's important to them through the filter of recognizing that everyone else, all of you, is important, are important. All of you are important because you've got that little spark deep inside of you that I have deep inside of me. Um, Emerson had a great quote. He said, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead to where there is no path and leave one. Thank you.